Dear brothers and sisters, I greet you on this Good Friday. It is finished. That was the last words of Jesus on the cross, according to the Gospel of John. It is also the last word of Jesus reflecting on his own death. After the resurrection, he doesn't discuss or reflect on his death any further. But for the believers, this is only the beginning of a long discussion, a long debate. What exactly is the meaning of Jesus' death? One example of this raging debate is the sermon text that I base my sermon on today. I read to you from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 15 to 28. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves, together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one, He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to all those who are waiting for him. It is finished. On one level, Jesus meant that in the sense of He had come and he had done what he had come to do. He had completed his task. His whole life culminated to this one point. All the teaching that he did is interlaced with an awareness that he had to die for our sins. Some people would say Jesus was only a great moral teacher. Some would argue that Jesus could have avoided his death if he could have just toned down his criticism of the powerful religious rulers, they would have left him in peace. But he had to rock the boat. If he had managed to do that, just tone it down a little bit, then he would have only been known for his wise moral teaching. But the truth is, His moral teachings cannot be separated from the fact that he believed and that he knew he is the Son of God who had to die for our sins. His interaction with the high council of the Jewish leaders is really clear. Are you the Son of God? His answer, you said it. Any other answer would have probably gotten him a pardon at that moment. But Jesus did not succumb to the bully tactics. 
He had to finish it. He couldn't stop halfway because everything he did up to that point would amount to absolutely nothing if he did that. Every healing, every teaching about the kingdom of God, every forgiving of sins, it would all be meaningless without it is finished. The famous author C.S. Lewis explains it like this. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else you would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So far, C.S. Lewis. And this much is also quite clear from the Gospel reading. And this is the primary way in which we understand it is finished. But that only answers the question in terms of what Jesus came to do. It does not explain the why. And that is where our sermon text can take us to a deeper understanding. Because it is finished can also be understood on a second level. It is finished does away with ineffective ways of dealing with sin once and for all. The sacrifices in the temple had to be repeated time and time again. We have spoken in quite a few sermons on the role of the high priest in Israel. So I won't get into details about that now. What is important to emphasize right now is this. The entire system was ineffective. Sacrifices had to be repeated time and time again. And the moment the sacrifice was over, there was an immediate need for another sacrifice because obviously somebody had sinned again. There was this frantic racing to stay ahead of the sin of the people and it became a never-ending panic for this system of animal sacrifices. It just didn't work because it was never finished. In modern times, we find some believers coming back to Jesus time and time again saying, Jesus, please, I want to be your child. Jesus, please, I want to be your child. Jesus, please, I want to be your child. And these believers never feel worthy of the salvation that Jesus has given them. And that is quite similar to this idea of this constant redoing of the sacrifice of the sacrifice. But with Jesus' death, it is truly finished and does not need Jesus to die again and again. It also does not need a new repeat work from us. Yes, we must repent of our sins daily and return to Jesus our Savior. But he does not stop being our Savior just because we have sinned or just because we cease to hold on to him. The prodigal son doesn't cease to be a son of his father just because he ran away. But it did mean that he had to return to his father's loving arms in order for him to experience being a son. Repentance does not make Jesus our Savior, but it does make us live deliberately in the reality that is the salvation that he gives us. But it is finished, doesn't stop with abolishing this ineffective system of dealing with sin. It actually sets up a new system entirely. It is finished. 
With these simple words, Jesus sets the new covenant in place. Why are these words so powerful? Because they are backed up by his actions, by his death, by his blood. The writer of Hebrews uses two pictures to describe the meaning of Jesus' death. Firstly, covenant. And a covenant was binding when it was sealed in blood. And then, secondly, inheritance. An inheritance comes into play when the one who bequeaths it dies. This is, in effect, the consequence of covenant. Interesting, both pictures fit quite nicely at first glance, but both are quite different to the usual way that these terms would be applied. A covenant is usually sealed with blood, but usually the blood of both parties. Jesus' new covenant is upheld by him and him only. He doesn't need our blood to keep his side. His grace is sufficient for us. And then inheritance. Inheritance comes into play when the giver is dead. But Jesus rose again from the dead. And still, the inheritance is in place, and we are the ones who benefit. In the end, all pictures we can use to describe what Jesus has done for us will always fall short of the fullness of Jesus' amazing sacrifices of grace. In the end, we can only accept it and live in that reality, even when we don't understand it fully. Jesus says, it is finished. Let us take him at his word on that.